Another edition of the Ordway podcast, where we talk about recurring revenue, which is capitalism's favorite business model. My name is Steve Kiefer. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Ordway and also the host for the show. Today, we have a very interesting guest who is a co-worker of mine at Ordway, uh, Max Rosenberg, who's the Vice President of Client Services. Welcome, Max. Nice to be here, Steve. So thanks for taking time. I know you've got a, a pretty crazy schedule with all the implementation works and things that we're doing. But um, just to give the audience some context, the topic for today's conversation is what I would argue is probably the most important part of recurring revenue business models, but also I think one of the most complicated ones, and I might be a little bit biased because I work at Wordway, but that is billing customers and actually collecting the payments. Um, it, it, that's really the heart of any business. And it, there are some unique challenges in the recurring revenue model uh, that I think uh, people are not necessarily familiar with. So I, I know a lot of you are listening to this going, wow, this sounds like a snoozer. Uh, bear with me here, because I think you're going to actually find this a lot more interesting uh, than you might think. Um, and it's a lot more complicated than you might think. Uh, some of you might think, well, you know, you've got a SaaS business model. I'm charging customers $50 per user per month. They have three users. They sign up for a 12-month contract. How hard could it be? I just got to charge their credit card once a month for $150. But it is often far, far more complex, particularly when you're dealing with enterprise accounts. Um, and so we're gonna get into some of this. Max has worked um, over the past several years with some of the fastest growing SaaS and cloud companies in the industry, helping them uh, overhaul their finance systems and get billing projects up and running. So he's got a wealth of insights on this. So let's jump in. Um, Max, uh, I imagine we have a variety of folks listening, some of which maybe, uh, considering implementing a billing project this year, some of which might just be more interested about how this stuff works, but maybe you could just give us a high level view of what's involved in that kind of project. Are there three, four, five kind of major phases uh, of things that folks need to do? Sure, yeah, so when we first kick off a project, we, th the main goal is to identify the use cases and solve these use cases. So when we have these initial discussions, we really ask clients to think about how, how can they bucket their existing customers into similar groups? So do you have one group that's monthly recurring and then another that is usage based and then another that has tiered pricing? We're looking for specifics so that we can solve one use case and then it basically rolls into the other dozens or hundreds of customers that are similar. We solve it once and then we can use it for the rest. But something else that we really get into, especially with these first implementations is what, what's the difference between their legacy business and where they wanna be. So switching to a new billing system really gives an opportunity to standardize uh, and provide some more structure for how they wanna close these deals going forward. We, we have a lot of, young companies that are very flexible with their pricing. And um, it's good because it makes it easier to win new business as you're trying to grow. But the challenge for the billing and the accounting team is, you know, how do we deal with this? How, how do we automate sending out these invoices or automate the rev rack when every deal is unique? It, it makes it really hard. So those are the conversations that we have initially where, okay, we need to solve for your existing business because we are going to load all of your in-flight subscriptions. If you're one year into a three-year contract, then years two and year three, you want Ordway or your billing system to send out those invoices, recognize that revenue. But also if you sign a new deal in six months, you want it to be set up to have whatever that future state structure is. So depending upon where a business is coming from and where they wanna be, it can be very complex. It can be a lot more standardized. You know, it really kind of depends where they're coming from and where they want to be. But um, in terms of the initial phase, going back to these buckets, so we've seen so many implementations. We know 
that if a, a customer starts to talk down a certain path, we can anticipate what they're actually going to want to do. So we're, we're pretty good about asking the questions to validate what we think that a customer is saying. A lot of the nomenclature going from one system to another, you might use the same words, but they might mean something different. You know, billing, does that yeah. mean you're, you're charging the credit card or does that mean you're sending the invoice? So there are nuances like this that we, we really get into. Throughout the whole process, there's little bits of training, making sure that the, the customer knows how Ordway works. The better that the customer is with Ordway, the more that they are going to bring to us what is relevant as opposed to us trying to tease out what is relevant. So once we identify these buckets, we, we have the client bring real life contracts that they have with these real customers and we recreate them in Ordway historically. And this is the validation, the proof that what Ordway is going to do from the billing for invoice creation perspective and from a referent perspective matches what they're expecting. So once, once we have that structure is good, client can really go live at this point with new business. So we have some clients that want to go live with new business and that kind of sets the universe of in-flight subscriptions. And we do that as a second phase, but sometimes we do have clients that want to go live with everything at once. So the, this next phase of the project is more of a data collection transformation exercise where we're pulling the customer data, the existing subscription data, the open invoices data, all of that, and loading it into Ordway. We, we have uh, import templates with Excel, CSV. So uh, it's, it's really just about getting the data, making sure it's clean and bring it into, into the system. So this again, it can be super easy, super straightforward. If there's clean data, if there isn't clean data, you know, sometimes some of the challenges that we see are in the CRM, whether it's Salesforce, HubSpot, uh, the, the deal that's closed isn't what was, and it was, it wasn't what was billed. So, you know, yeah, there was, can't, that's, that's never, that never happens. Right. And that, yeah. So, you know, in those situations, the, the client typically has to go back and see, okay, was the Salesforce data correct? Or do they have to go into their QuickBooks or NetSuite or Intact to see what were we actually invoicing for and, and do some work to, to give us the right data. Cause at, at the end of the day, if, if the subscription goes in incorrectly, then the word, the, the invoices, the RevRec is, it's not going to be correct either. So, um, you know, the cleaner the data is, the easier, the faster that it, that it, uh, the implementation uh, goes. And then, so once we have all this data, it's clean, it's loaded into Ordway, then we have our go live. So at this point, we do an exercise to align deferred revenue. So we will, we will go customer by customer. And within Ordway, we can see in the future post go live, what's going to be recognized, what's going to be invoiced. So based on Ordway's data, we know deferred revenue should be X for this customer. So there's an exercise where we compare that deferred revenue to what the customer, the client was previously tracking for each of these customers. And there might be a little variance it might be due to a proration on RevRec. If a contract starts on the 15th of the month, a lot of clients will just book a full month's worth of RevRec Ordway because it's all automated. We're going to prorate for a half month of RevRec. And so you might have a little variance there. Um, but sometimes there are recurring RevRep journal entries that are set up in the GL. And uh, if there's a subscription change, like an upsell mid-contract, and then that recurring revenue entry isn't also updated, then you might have an expanding variance that increases over time. So going through this implementation will catch those. So it will be able to fix them, go live. And then on the, the other big action is on the AR side, we will bring in all at a minimum, all unpaid invoices into Ordway. This will make sure that Ordway's AR and aging match with the client's expecting, but it will also allow Ordway to send out statements and dunning and collections notices and all that for these open invoices so that the billing and collections team can live fully out of Ordway. They don't have to live out of Ordway and their legacy system at the same time. Wow. That, that's a, a pretty long list of stuff. Uh, you know, if I put my consulting speak on sort of current state design, future state design, data migration, integrations, 
testing, reconciliation, and data cleanup, uh, you know, not, not only for billing, but in a lot of cases, the same system is being used for rep rack, accounts receivable, all that stuff. So, so my next question is, how long does that take? How many years does it take to go live? Uh, what, what's a typical kind of project length you see? Let's say it's a $100 million SaaS company or $10 million SaaS company. And, and beyond the data migration, like what are kind of the key things that, that slow it down the most, if any? For sure. So we, we target three months start to finish so that, uh, okay. you know, there, there are a combination of factors, though. Client availability, the more that we're able to meet in the beginning, the faster we get to that solution and the use cases, then we can move more to working offline, the data validation, the data loading. We don't need one on one calls for that as much. So if, if a client's able to meet every day of the week, we can solve the, the use case in a week and it, it be done with it and then just move on to the data portion after that. But in, in most cases, clients have their regular day job and this is just part of that. So if we can meet two or three times a week for an hour and a half, two hours, we could probably get the use cases solution within the first two weeks. And then depending on the integrations, like if we're integrating with Salesforce, Clients either have an in-house Salesforce admin. A lot of clients have Salesforce consultants. So now we're coordinating schedules with additional people. And on the Salesforce side, typically clients have an existing process and there's a whole discussion about how flexible are they with their existing process? Do you want sales reps to have no change? In which case it's a little more work on, on our side to tie everything because it's a data mapping exercise, but if Ordway okay. needs a piece of data and that data doesn't exist in Salesforce today, then clearly we need to either create a field or a flow, something automated that's going to populate that so Ordway can receive it. So if, if a, a client wants no change, it's a little more work on the Salesforce side. If the client is a little flexible on the Salesforce side, then we have a really good out of the box solution. We call it plan picker. It's basically a menu that sales reps can choose these these products, we can customize what they're able to change and what they're not able to change. So for example, uh, maybe you don't want to allow a sales rep to ever be able to change the list price. If they want to change the price, they have to add a discount. So then it's easier to track who's giving discounts as opposed to just a lower list price. So it's all customizable. Obviously, there's a little bit of training that goes into any uh, anything like that. And then on the GL side, integrating whether it's QuickBooks, Intact, Zero, NetSuite, any of those, the the integration there, it's it's not as complex because it's less uh, users doing stuff. It's more just data transition. So at a high level, we can either uh, integrate by sending the actual transaction object. So an, an invoice is created in Ordway, and that invoice is created in NetSuite or we can sync journal entries. So Ordway would be the system of record for the actual transactions, and then the journal entries associated with all of this transactions, that's what would get integrated with the GLs. So it's, um, it really depends on what's happening, you know, what, which systems we're integrating with, what the flexibility is. And so going back to how long does this take? So uh, yeah. integrating with a GL, that might be a one call thing. But if there's a consultant that manages their GL, it might take a, a week to schedule that call. It might need to go through some level of approval for which of these two solutions do we want to use. So uh, we target three, three months at the end of the day. The fastest that we've done is two and a half, three weeks for someone that was really wow. ready to go. They had their data, uh, you know, it's, it's totally manageable. And then for Larger projects, occasionally it does go longer, but it's, uh, if you have multi-entity, like we've had, we've had clients that have six or seven entities and they want to go live one entity at a time. So in that scenario, you really can't go live in three months with all entities. We're live with at least one of the entities in the, f the first three months, but then it's probably one entity a month after that, just to stagger it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So. Resource availability, integrations, data quality, uh, all factors. I imagine if they're simultaneously implementing a new ERP system or CPQ or something that adds just even more complexity to it. 
Um, sure. So you, you mentioned something really interesting, though, about the, the availability of the resources and like the Salesforce administrator. So let's let's drill into that a little more. Like, who's the project team? Because most of the small SaaS companies I've been at, you're, you're lucky if there's one full time person working on billing in AR. It's usually a fraction of a person in finance. So as you mentioned, this is <clears throat> you know a part of people's uh, day jobs, like who's the core team, who's kind of the extended team to typically get involved in these projects? Yeah, so again, we, we see a variety and that's part of those initial calls to figure out who's the owner of what. So as part of our kickoff, we have a checklist of who on the client side is responsible for making decisions on things like billing. So who's gonna validate that the invoicing cadence is correct? revenue recognition, who's going to validate that rev rec and order way is correct, who's going to provide the correct chart of accounts. Uh, and then typically there's a project manager. They're responsible for making sure that we're going to go live on time and that everyone on their team is showing up and deliverables so are being met on this. on the customer side? In, in, the, in the ideal situation, yes. Okay. So th that project okay. manager may also be the billing expert, depending upon the client. So they might have multiple roles. And in a, like, we just kicked off a client where they have one project manager who he's running the calls, but they have another person who's the billing and the finance SME. So it's really good because it's a small number of people that, you know, that it gets more challenging when you have more people just because of the coordination of you know, who's available for what call oh, and, interesting. you know, clients. And we also, we want to know, okay, what, what are we going to discuss on this call? And the way that we go use case by use case, well, in each use case, there's both billing and revenue. So we, we need a billing person and we need the revenue person when we're validating this stuff. So if, if it's the same person, great. But at, at the end of the day, typically there's a billing person, there's typically a finance slash accounting person. And those are the two most important people by far. Without them, we're, we're stuck because we, or do I can't validate that this is right? We, we can give our, yeah. our two cents, our best guess, but we, we cannot say without the client giving the thumbs up that, yeah, this is correct. So um, billing and accounting slash finance. And then uh, that's How really it. Rev ops, you know? Product management, customer success. You ever, those folks ever get involved in the, in the implementation project or is it more after it goes live? So RevOps a bit more, um, they, they all have their two cents in terms of, uh, when we're doing the Salesforce integration that they, they, they might have a say there, but a lot of that, like the customer success, we try to have those conversations during implementation because customer success often has, uh, additional requirements that come and we'd love to get those before it go live, but sometimes they come in after. An example would yeah. be, we want to run a report on uh, aging, but we want to group it by customer success um, manager. And so uh, if Boardway yeah. doesn't have a custom field for customer success manager, we obviously can't run the report yet. So it's, it's a simple exercise in this example. We create the custom field, load the data for a CSM by, by customer, and then we can run the report. But the sooner we have the, the, these people involved, with their two cents, a lot of it ends up being re reporting requirements and uh, the reporting requirements at the end of the day, yeah, we can do the data load, but that data going forward, we don't want to have to do a data load. We want to have that coming from Salesforce. So does that field exist in Salesforce? If it doesn't, now it also needs to be created in Salesforce and mapped into Wordway. So it, um, it depends, but you know, we, we have a different client right now where it's not two people, it's like, 12 people that are involved. And, you know, it's, it's just a little more challenging because we, we really need to drill in who is the decision maker. We know we're going to have a lot of opinions. We're going to have a lot of people that have comments and, you know, would like things to be one way or the other. But at the end of the day, if we don't have one person that says, this is what we're doing, then it gets a little challenging. Wow. Uh, a lot more complicated than I thought. Um, Let's shift gears a little bit. I want to drill into some of the different areas of the implementation project. And uh, one that I think a lot of people don't think about is the, the actual design of the invoice document. You know, I, I know I get a lot of invoices from SaaS companies as my team manages the 
sales tech and martech stack, but I, I kind of zone in on the, the line item, how much do we owe and the due date, but there's a lot of other information on the invoice. And I think there's a, there's a art and a science to making sure that you've given people enough information that they don't reach out and ask you a hundred questions, but also not so much information that you introduce new questions. So what are some of the questions with the ways that you consult and coach people on thinking about invoice design? So it kind of goes back to the similar idea of the clients come in with what they're doing today, you know, their, their present state. And we talk about, look, we can copy exactly what you have. We can use our template logic. We could recreate the templates so that your clients have no idea that you're using a new billing system, or you can use this app as an opportunity to go through a, a little consulting project and figure out how can we improve this? is what questions have you gotten historically on these invoices that we can tackle by making improvements? So we're able to basically, if the data exists in Ordway, we can put it on the invoice. We can hide it from the invoice. In certain scenarios, we can make things look different. So we, we have clients that might have segmented customer groups. So they might have an enterprise group and then a self-serve group. And for the enterprise, they wanna show one level of detail but on the self-serve, they want to show another level of detail and they might even want to, they have different branding for the two potentially. So you might have coloring for one and then coloring for another. So just talking through what is the logic? Cause again, we need rules. So this is in this scenario, when this flag is there, do it this way. If it's not do it that way. So we really work with a client on, on how, how can we improve this? Because again, we, we want to do as much of this work before go live that we can, because after go live, there's just a little more urgency, you know, on the client, they're live, they, they want to get these invoices out. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely nicer to do this pre go live, but so, so a few examples are discounts. So a lot of our clients give discounts, but in reality, if you're not giving a customer a discount, you don't want to show that there's a discount column because they're going to be like, wait, why am I not getting a discount? So we Never can, thought of that. yeah, so we, we can use the logic that says if there's no discount, do not display the discount column. If there is a discount, display the discount column. Um, but yeah, we, we've got situations where the client is actually selling for products, but they, it's really a bundled product. So they're getting this package. This package includes these four things. And in certain situations, the client wants to show all four lines that these are the four things you're getting. But in other situations for the simplicity to kind of reduce the questions, they might only want to display the package so that clients don't ask, you know, what about these other three or four things? So there, there's a variety of ways to do it. We've got clients that have uh, their banking information on the invoice so they don't get the email saying hey can you send me your banking information the vast majority of our clients have some integrated payment processor so on the invoice itself there's a button you can click it that takes them to the the payment information portal yeah. with what they can add their ach or credit card and again it just it reduces the number of interactions to actually get paid uh and yeah it's it's something that if the client has someone on their team who has the coding knowledge, it's it's a liquid template knowledge, then they don't even need Ordway's people to make these updates. They can go in there and do it themselves on the fly. So we try to make it as self-serve as possible. You need it to be a little bit technical, but it's uh, you, you don't need to be a full-blown engineer to be able to do this sort of thing. Yeah, I, I don't think people have any idea how much like programmability there is into these invoice templates. That's that's amazing. I love the examples you're giving. Yeah. Um, let, let's drill down in another area of one of the line items on the invoice that I think people underappreciate the complexity of, which is the, the sales taxes. Um, and let's forget about the international stuff, the VAT and GST, and that, that's a whole other uh, hornet's nest of issues. But just think about the U.S. only, like we have such a complex system of how we tax goods and services on the internet. And SaaS is one of many different categories. I know that some states tax it, others don't. Some tax it once it gets a certain dollar threshold or a certain number of transactions, but certain customers are exempt. There's sales tax holidays. Uh, some cases, it's not just the state, but the city or the county that's also 
uh, taxing. So wh what are some of the issues that come up around the implementation with sales tax? How do most of the customers handle that? So we, or Ordway has its own tax table module. So if the client is willing to manage this table. So every year go in an update that at the, the sales tax in Texas went from 11 to 12%, yeah. then it's totally doable to manage it directly in Ordway itself. Most of our clients use one of our partners, Avalara, Anrak. They manage these tax tables for you. And Ordway actually makes taxes pretty simple. The, at the product level, the product is either taxable or not. If if it's never taxable, then it's not. If it's sometimes taxable, then it is. And what really drives the tax is the shipping address on any particular customer. So if a product's taxable, but the address is not in one of the, those taxable districts, then there, there will be no tax on the invoice. So when we do implementation, we are going through and, and doing tests. We'll, we'll do tests in states and cities where there are there's supposed to be taxes, and we'll do okay. tests where there are not supposed to be taxes, and we'll validate that the t there is no tax on that one and there's tax on this one. And where we find issues is generally data issues. Either you know the, the state was wrong, the zip code was wrong, there was a spelling error on something, and and when it gets fixed, it gets fixed. But it's um. It ends up being pretty straightforward. The one other nuance is we do have some customer customers that are truly tax exempt, and there is just a, a field, a, a flag on each customer, tax exempt, yes or no. So even if that customer is in a taxable district, if they are marked as tax exempt, then they, they won't get taxed. And this is also on a on a product level. So if you sell twenty different things. There's a, a tax code that integrates with these with these tax partners so that if SaaS is taxed one way, but services are taxed another, there, that code links to the system that will put the correct tax on, on the invoice, depending upon what kind of product it, it is. Yeah, this is the stuff I geek out on. It's just fast, like one little line item on an invoice. We could probably spend four hours with tax experts talking about the differences in all these different municipalities and the, all the exceptions sure. and things that you have to account for. So it's, it's just another underappreciated area that the finance team has to deal with in its recurring revenue models. Um, Definitely. A, another one that I find is really complex and interesting is around the payment processing. So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's SaaS, it's really easy. People just put their credit card in, they set up auto pay, you invoice them every month, you charge them every month. What is there to do? How hard could it be? Um, but you know, first of all, you know, credit cards are expensive. Not everybody wants to give two or 3% of their revenue to Stripe or whoever the payment processor is. So a lot of people are looking at bank transfers, whether it's ECH in the U.S. or Canadian prepaid debit. There's different ones in every country. Um, and a lot of finance leaders I know don't like auto pay, right? I mean, who wants a $50,000 invoice coming in that just gets automatically paid without someone reviewing and approving? So, you know, particularly as, as SaaS companies get bigger and more enterprise clients, the billing gets more complex because they've got to invoice the customers and the wait for them to pay, which might be via card, via ACH, a wire transfer. They may send a paper check in the mail, uh, which is a whole, creates a whole set of issues. So what are some of the things that you talk through during the implementation process around payments um, and, and the coaching you provide clients in those areas? Sure. Yeah. So being integrated with a, a, a payment gateway definitely reduces friction. That's that's the biggest jump that that a customer can make by changing a process. So we do have some some clients that come to Ordway, they don't have any payment processor, they just receive checks in the mail. Now, wow. Okay. The, it, yeah, so this from from an AR perspective, from a manpower perspective, it's it's rough because a client will put the check in the mail, they think it's been paid. You don't receive it for 4 or 5 days. By the time you get around to depositing the check, it might be another few days or a week. And yeah. then by the time it actually transfers the money. So you, you have potentially a couple of weeks to a month of where Float. the client thinks it's been paid to the point where it's actually been paid and closed out. So it's, it's really mm -hmm. hard to manage AR and aging in that situation. So we recommend integrating with the gateway 
even if they say, oh, our clients, they're old school, they only are going to send us checks. Well, maybe if you do the, the gateway and put the option out there, maybe 5% of your customers transition or maybe new business in, in your contract, you start saying, hey, we don't receive checks anymore. So it's a, you start the, that transition to make it easier over time. <coughs> but the uh, yeah, I mean, there's complexity with the payments because customers in certain countries, certain gateways won't support certain country uh, doing oh, a, right. a transaction. So depending on where your customers are, you might be limited to the certain gateways or certain types of transactions. So yeah, it, it really depends on the customer. It depends on their their customer segments, where they're located, what kind of payments they're making, what in industry are they in? There are certain industries that the banks don't want to deal with. And so they're limited as well. So it's, it's uh, look, if, if you can get all of your customers on auto pay, then you're just dealing with credit card expirations. You know, like that's going to happen, but that's not that big of a deal. You just, we have automated emails that say, hey, your credit card expired, please put in a new one. So it, that doesn't increase your 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 workload or, or your hours that you need to spend on this stuff. But uh, just having the gateway integrated, allowing for that auto pay, even if clients don't use it, just allow, make it so that they get that email that, hey, this invoice is due, but their, their ACH information is preloaded. They still have to press the button to actually send it. But instead of them calling their their admin to say hey what what's our banking information can you enter it you know there's back and forth again that that takes time and delays the payment so it's uh it's a complex thing but it it's much more beneficial to have a gateway integrated than that interesting so invoices statements all these things uh are really forms of customer communications and i know most businesses don't necessarily think about it that way. Um, but there's an ongoing series of communications that need to accompany the invoice to pay process. You know, we all have recurring billing relationships with whether it's with, you know, streaming providers or, or work. And we're used to getting these emails. There's a new invoice. Here's a link to it. Reminders the invoices do. Confirmations the payment went through. You know, if the credit card expires, you know, a nudge to try to get you to go and update the auto payment details. Um, does everybody pretty much use the same email templates and the same cadence of communications or, or do you have abilities to configure and vary there, you know, who you're sending it to, you know, the frequency, the types of messages. Talk to me about some of the issues that come up there in billing implementations. Sure. So th this is mostly related to AR and collections. So we, if, if you don't have an automated system, you have someone that's, going into your GL, seeing which invoices are not paid, finding the associated email address, sending out one-off emails. This is, it's enough for full-time employees, but it's a fully automatable process. And so with an ORD way, we have a Dunning workflow. You can have as many layers as you want. So what we typically see is a week past due, two weeks past due, a month past due, maybe two months past due. Depending upon what their business is, they, they might not let it go that far. But with each escalating level, they usually have escalating language. So that seven week past due might be, hey, friendly reminder, submit your payment. The 60 days past due might be, hey, we're going to shut off your service if you don't receive, if we don't receive payment uh, this week. So that, that has been super useful, fully automated. And we're, we're also able to, filter for which customers actually receive or don't receive these emails. So we have a lot of clients that might have a group of their customers that are, they're special. They only want to do white glove treatment. They don't want anything automated going to them. So for those, we would exclude them from, from this automated process. They, they might be in a scheduled report that goes to the CSMs weekly. And then the CSMs do more of the high touch individual reach out to those. On the statement side, again, it's it's fully filterable and we can schedule it. So once a month, any client that owes us over a thousand dollars, we're going to send them a statement that has an email that says, hey, these are the open invoices, please pay them. And on the statement, we'll have a list of the invoices, when their due date was, 
how many days past due it's been, what they're owed with a link to pay to make it easy to pay all at once. So the, uh, the email automation is, is really helpful. And it's not just for that. Like you said, it's, uh, your, your payment failed. So it might not be the credit card expired, but maybe a payment failed. So instead of one of your AR people seeing that a payment failed and then sending the email, as soon as that payment fails, because it's, it's a via the payment gateway in Ordway, Ordway knows it's failed. That payment, that email will automatically get sent to that client right away with a link to re enter the payment information for a new card or ACH or whatever. And it, it allows for a lot of these issues to get resolved on their own without human intervention. Got it. Another, every one of these areas uh, is just so complicated. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. Um, let's talk about integrations. And I know one of the challenges when you have a new customer that you're setting up is uh, how does the information get into the billing system? And if we keep it simple or maybe old school and think about like sales led growth models, which is still where a lot of the SaaS industry is. You know, a lot of that information is being captured during the sales process in the CRM. So, you know, HubSpot, Salesforce, Dynamics, and then it's got to get into the billing system. I know particularly with Salesforce, Dynamics, a lot of these CRM applications, one of the first things that companies do when they buy those systems is hire consultants to come in and configure them to match their business processes or the way they want to run, run their uh, go-to-market processes. So I, I imagine that just complicates the interchange of the data with the billing system. But talk... Talk to me about what some of the issues there are that you encounter uh, during billing implementations with connecting to the CRM. Yeah, so it's it's sometimes that the data that's getting input is not the actual data. So going back to the, some of the challenges that we face during implementation, it's okay on on the opportunity they put a quantity of ten at a price of a hundred dollars per per unit, but by the time it actually gets signed, it was downloaded and put into a, a, a word doc. And then the CEO changed, you know, one of the numbers and that, that number never, never got back into Salesforce. So, uh, ensuring that everything that's happening in the process from when it starts as a lead to actually is a closed one opportunity, all the data remains in sales in, in the CRM, that's table stakes critical. If, if that's not the case, then order is not going to get the correct data. So uh, making sure that the whole process actually exists in the system is, is, is critical. And then it's, is there stuff that Ordway needs, a variable thing that does not exist today in the CRM? And then it's figuring out where is the best place to put it? Is it uh, just a field on the opportunity? Is it something that we can automate that depending upon the geographic region of the contact, maybe that drives something? So we, we have a few Salesforce consultants that we regularly work with. They're Ordway experts. So when we have clients that choose to work with them, it makes it a lot easier. We don't, we don't have to be as involved, but we have a, a Salesforce solution architect in-house that works directly with our clients, consultants when they have them to provide the best practices and talk through you know, what, what are challenges that other clients have faced when doing something similar and how have they dealt with them. So at the end of the day, Salesforce in particular, it's great because you can truly do whatever you want. You just might have to put in a little bit of time and effort to get it to that point. Good stuff. So if we think about like CRM CPQ is the primary upstream system for the billing, uh, but, but there's downstream systems as well, right? Like it's not just the producing the invoice. There's journal entries, whether they're associated with revenue recognition or AR, billing, cash collection, and then I've got to get into the general ledger, whether that's part of an accounting system or an ERP. And same kind of issue there where you go out and you buy NetSuite. The first thing you do is bring in some consultants to help configure it to support your specific business processes. I imagine that's a little less the case with QuickBooks Online or Zero or some of those things. But, but what are some of the challenges that come in when you're implementing a billing system with, with connecting to the ERP or the GL? Uh, it, again, it could be data inconsistencies. So the data that is in uh, the GL is not doesn't tie directly to what was in Salesforce or the CRM. It could be that the data structure. So we, we have some clients that they don't have any 
customer specific data. It's just summary journal entries. So they don't have the specific invoices for each customer in the GL. Well, when we switch to Ordway, do you, do you want to have that in there now? If you do, how do we handle that kind of transition of data in the GL where previously you just had journal entries, now we're switching to invoices. One unique complexity to that situation is when you have an invoice in a GL and you have a payment, that payment actually closes out a specific invoice. When you just have journal entries, an invoice is going to create AR and a payment's going to reduce the AR, but it's not closing out any particular you know, journal entry. So th there's just usually a conversation that needs to happen around current state, future state, what do we need to do to transition between the two? Because uh, going through Ordway, again, we've got a few different ways that we can integrate with the GLs. So it's, it's we're sending transactions, we're sending journal entries, or you're doing summary journal entries. Those are kind of your three options. <coughs> and just picking one with the client to see what what is what do their finance team, what, what do they want? What's What's going to be best? What, what do they want to be able to pull directly out of Ordway versus what do they want to be able to pull out of their GL? Got it. Uh, lots of complexity there, uh, depending upon how you want to do it. You know, what? I, that's what I find interesting is, uh, you know, all these companies, everybody's got the same sort of financial processes, but the variability in how people do them and even set up the systems is, is really interesting because every different controller and CFO has a different perspective on how they want to run the books and stuff. So another area of complexity. So, so let's move to the kind of the last mile of the billing implementation. So we've got the CRM integrated, you've got the general ledger integrated, you've got your invoice design, you figured out how you're going to calculate taxes, how you're going to calculate payments, how you're going to do dunning and customer communications. So now you're ready to really get the billing system live into action. So what, what are some of the big things that need to, to go on there? I imagine you want to test whether the system's working right or not, right? I mean, if you start cutting over and you send out a bunch of invoices with the wrong amounts, that's probably not going to go over well with the customers. But but how do most SaaS companies do that? Because there, there's got to be just an infinite number of permutations of, you know, I mean, you've got the existing customer set, but then you think about new customers coming on and all the different combinations of renewals and upgrades and new products, and new pricing, and geographies and taxes and all that stuff. So how do you simplify this so that you can Pareto it and actually get it done and not, not test for two years? Sure. So we we typically will have a, a targeted go live date. So if we're if we're shooting for a March 1st go live date, then we are going to want to have all of this testing done before then. So what we, at a high level, what needs to be done is you have your existing billing system that needs to be turned off. So whatever automations you have, maybe it's you have uh, recurring QuickBooks invoices, Stripe invoices, whatever it is, you need to turn that off because you don't want to send one client an invoice from QuickBooks, but also an invoice from, from Ordway. That, that's not a good look. So you turn that off. And then within Ordway, while we have the ability to fully automate everything, those first few days, we are doing things in the UI kind of one step at a time, validating each step of the process as these are the actual invoices that are supposed to go out. So prior to this, we have fully tested all the use cases. We've generated everything. Things have been validated. But since this is the, the real data that's getting posted to the GL, that's going to the client, we're extra cautious. We will generate the invoice in the UI. We will, on the call with the client, look at the, the, the PDF. Is everything correct? Is it missing anything that you need? If we need to do some last minute tweaks, we'll have our designer hop on the call, make those updates, send out the invoice right away. We'll make sure that the journal entry is being created properly, that the, however, we've set up the integration with the GL, that the data is syncing over properly. We'll follow up once we receive the payment that again, journal entry is created properly, the data is syncing to the GL properly. All of the automated emails are starting to go out. And as the client is getting more and more comfortable that, all right, when we're doing this, we're not needing to make updates, then we can automate. So once we get more and more comfortable, then instead of a user going in and generating an invoice, we have a daily scheduled billing run that scans all of the subscriptions in Ordway and says, all right, this one, we need an invoice created for this one today. 
it creates it, it posts it, it emails it. And so over the first few weeks, we, we get to that point where we're not in the system with the customer. They're not really doing stuff. It's, it's getting to that fully automated process. And uh, the, the last step of it is making sure that the client is closing their books properly, quickly, efficiently. And so we'll work with the, the customer at month end for the first couple of months, just to make sure that again, no issues, everything is super clear, crystal clear. They're confident with what their steps are, their processes. We'll put together SOPs for them to, uh, in case they hire a new person who's going to be doing this, they have you know a checklist that they're going through instead of relying on someone with knowledge in their head to share that because we, we don't want anything lost in translation. In, in terms of the actual migration and cutover, do, do most customers move everything over at once or do they do it in phases where like, we're just going to take new business and we're going to run that through the new billing system and we're going to leave the old stuff alone until we get everything, all just the new accounts working um, and do it in sort of multiple phases. And then maybe even come back as a third phase and pick up the, the churn customers, the historical ones that even aren't with us anymore, but just to have everything in a single system or, or do people do it all at once and just big bang or is it a mix of, of, all of the above? I would say it's close to 70, 30, where the majority wants to go live all at once. And then 30% will do some sort of phases. So <laughs> the phases may be I new business. the opposite. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. The, and I think the reasoning is the, the client doesn't want to have to be working out of two systems that like, that's the biggest reason to not do it in phases is they. They want to have a hard cut over okay. and be able to be fully in Ordway and not have to be in Ordway and their other system. So it's, um, you know, for, for complexity in terms of data transition, it's definitely simpler to just go live with new business in Ordway, let existing contracts kind of bleed out. And, and then when the renewal happens or if a change happens, put that renewal or change in Ordway and make the transition at that point. Uh, because okay. then we don't have to, in order way, you don't need to deal with the deferred revenue cut over the same way. It, it, the deferred revenue challenge is mid contracts. If you're starting a contract brand new, there's no cut over that's needed. The deferred revenue is just going to be set when that first invoice goes out. So uh, it's it, the reason why clients want to go live with everything at once is typically because they just want to live fully out of one system. Yeah. And I imagine if, if you're using something really expensive, having to pay for that second system while the contract exactly. can be expensive. Exactly. The, the one other thing I hear a lot about is just kind of switching over payment gateways. Like if someone switches from Braintree to Stripe or you know, Stripe to something else, like how does that all work with getting the credit card numbers from the one from the previous provider over to the new one? Sure. So the at a high level, the client will speak with their existing gateway provider and their future gateway provider. It will tell them, Hey, we're, we're transitioning. And in the background, the two gateway providers will transfer the, the their customer information with the, the credit card details, but it, in a very encrypted way. So the, at the end of the day, the new gateway will have all of the existing client payment information, which is great for our client because they don't need their customers to re-enter their credit card information. In terms of transitioning yeah. payment gateways, the biggest, uh, the biggest, it's not a challenge, it's more of a concern, is that if you're gonna require client customers to re-enter credit card information, some percentage of them are not going to, and it's gonna cause yeah. some churn. So in the background, this happens, Clients have no idea this is happening. There's no impact on them, and it ends up working out uh, out really well. So that it's uh, we've had uh, many customers switch gateways during implementation, and it's uh, generally they're switching because they're either lower fees or they support customers in a different geographic location. You know, there's some reason behind the transition, but it, it generally works out pretty well. Well, you, you're like a walking encyclopedia of knowledge on this billing implementation stuff. And, and I could probably keep asking you questions all afternoon, um, but I know you have other things to do. Uh, but maybe give just some context for the audience. Um, you know, how, how long have you been doing this 
uh, stuff here at Ordway, how long you've been with the company and, and what were you doing before that? Sure. So uh, in March, it'll be four years that I've been with Ordway. So I, I started off running implementations myself and uh, then the team and customer success. And so I've, I've been in the weeds, have, have seen it all and uh, still am, am, am very involved day to day in a lot of the implementations in these projects. So just seeing the use cases, seeing the evolution of the Ordway product itself, it's, it's been really insightful and I, I've learned a ton. Uh, a lot of what Ordway has put in has been due to previous cl client requests. So uh, the, the product, what it was four years ago, it's, it, it is now way more capable and powerful than uh, it, it was when I first started. And so that, that's just thanks to a lot of the feedback from, from prospects, from existing customers, what, the, what they want to do. But uh, before Ordway, I was not in the billing or RevRec space at all. I, I spent seven years as a management consultant with Accenture. So just a lot of product management, problem solving, trying to make things more efficient, improve processes. So uh, similar in the sense that when you do an implementation, it's really a mini consulting project of, okay, yeah, yeah. This, this is the yeah. end result you're looking for. What's the best way to get there? What else can you do that you're not even thinking of? What can we suggest? How can we help you? So uh, that, that background is really helpful. Uh, in terms of transitioning to Ordway, I did have a little stint where I uh, launched a dating app and took some time to try to go pro in golf. But that that was a, a little mid-career uh, quick transition to, to some would call it a midlife crisis. But found my way to Ordway, and it's been uh, it's been a good four years so far. I don't think you're old enough to have a midlife crisis, but we're, you know, on the one hand, we're glad that you were, uh, the, the PGA thing didn't work out because we have you here, but on the other hand, uh, it would have been great to see you out there. So you joined Accenture right out of school? Uh, I spent one year with Business in Insider as uh, uh, an editorial intern okay. first. So I was actually doing some, oh, some writing. Yeah, great. that was my first foray into startups. They were, they were a pretty small company back then. And it was, that kind of got me the itch for the startup world, because Accenture, a huge company, it's a uh, yeah. you know much different experience day to day. So uh, I love startups. The, and the insider and the dating app as well, you know, yeah. from a startup yeah, yeah. standpoint. So you understand the, the position the customers in in a lot of these cases, where for sure they have the resources and they're just figuring it out as they go along. For sure. Good. Well, um, well, I know you're super busy with all these implementations. Really appreciate you taking an hour and walk through the detail of all this. And I, I know I learn a lot every time that I have these conversations with you and I imagine a lot of our current and future prospective customers, as well as just other interested parties listening to the episode, probably got a lot out of this as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. No problem. Thanks for having me, Steve. And thanks to everyone in the audience for uh, listening to this. Hopefully I came through my promise uh, that this is, is one of the most important and, and also one of the most complicated areas of the recurring revenue business model. And we hope you will join us again on a future episode of the Order We podcast where we talk about capitalism's favorite business model. <laughs>